Can't see. Anin. Good afternoon. Awanagab we condition cash. Wabashije and Dodem. My English name is Karen Olson. I was born and raised on the Pegwas First Nation in Manitoba. My parents are Gordon Olson, whose ancestry includes Anishinaabe, Mushkego Cree, French, and Danish. And my mother is Wajash Gejikwe, Eleanor Olson. She is of Mushkego Cree and Scottish heritage. I am really honoured today to present this beautiful history of dance of at Pegwas First Nation. In the Mashomas book, Eddie Benton Benet writes, Gije Manidu took four parts of Mother Earth and blew into them using a sacred mega shell. From the union of the four sacred elements and his breath, man was created. Gije Manidu then lowered man to the earth, and thus man was the last form of life to be placed on earth. From this original man came the Anishinaabe people. In the Anish Nabe language, if you break down the word Anishinaabe, this is what it means. Ani, from whence, Nishina, lowered, Abbe, male of the species. And when original man stepped onto the earth for the first time, the very first dance step was taken. With his right foot extended, his toes touched the ground, and then his heel. He repeated the movement with his other foot, and thus we came to Mother Earth in dance. And this is still how Anishinaabe dance. And in every dance step we recognize and honor this sacred moment when man first stepped onto the earth. Around 1774, Bugwis, an Bay was born in Bawiting, near present-day Sault Ste. Marie at the east end of Lake Superior. He is most commonly referred to as Little Chip, and the uh, early texts tell the story that he was abandoned as a baby and later found on a pile of wood chips and taken into the tribe. Uh, later on, he became known as Chief Peguis. Now, in these early days, the Anishinaabe held annual spring and autumn celebrations at Bawiting, since it was a central location. The bands would come together for several days to sing, feast, and enjoy lively sports competitions for the men, while the women held sewing and quill work competitions. It was also a time for the leaders to commemorate uh, tribal bonds, conduct pipe ceremonies and sweat lodges, and uh, as well as discuss war and trade. Now, this social gathering was also a time to arrange marriages, and to celebrate significant events such as naming and walking out ceremonies for young children. And they also recognized a boy's first hunt or a girl's entry into womanhood. In these early days, these social dances were known as Anishinaabe Nimowin. It was mostly men performing individual dances that they received in dreams or dances that recounted events, deeds, and exploits. The woman danced usually on the sides, and uh, they would encourage and cheer on their family members. Dance was a way for the history, beliefs, stories, and customs to be handed down. Now, of course, in time, the nature of our relationship to other tribes extended Nimuin to larger social gatherings, and now we call them powwows. The categorization of dances began when our sister and brother nations introduced their dances and their songs. Originally, hand drums that you see at the top left provided the music at the Nimuin. Water drums you'll see on the bottom right with that long handled drumstick. They were only used in Medewin ceremonies in the Medewin Lodge. The big drum, as you see in the center, was one of the greatest changes that came to the Anishinaabe people. This was introduced by the Hathuska Society from the Ponca and the Omaha nations from the south. Now, the Hathuska was a drum and dance society, and they introduced what was known as a war dance, which is a dance based in pride. They wore regalia, Head brooches, feather belts, and bustles made of crow feathers. 
Of course, as the dance grew among nations, the eagle feathers replaced the crow feathers. The big dance drum came to the Anishinaabe through Wana Ikwe, tail feather woman. Now she was a Dakota and she was given a spiritual vision where she was shown ceremonies, dances and songs, how to build a big drum and what objects and items were to accompany it. To fulfill her vision, Wana Ikwe was to pass the drum on to the Anishinaabe people. And so she did. Now this dream drum journeyed from community to community and it was a ceremony at first and the big drum was only used for those ceremonies. However, in time, the big drum was also brought into the social dances and they did not include the ceremonial songs, the dances. Uh, they, it was used more as a, uh, you know, to provide the music for the dances. By 1870, the big drums were in use by the Plains Ojibwe in central Manitoba and by the northern Ojibwe of the Great Lakes area where Bugwis and his people lived. The grass dance came from the Sioux Nation, first to the Lakota who called it the Omaha Dance, which referred to its place of origin in the now present United States. It was picked up by the Dakota Nation who called it the grass dance because of the braided sweet grass the dancers carried or tied to their belts on the original outfits. With the grass dance came the move, the freedom to create new moves, new steps, and led singers to create new songs and melodies. Today, grass dancers are often called upon to perform the first dance at the powwows. Uh, they acknowledge their role uh, to form the dance circle by flattening the grass and they, in doing so they recognize the history of this graceful and powerful dance. Great Lakes area women and Cree women wore buckskin strap dresses for daily wear and later on they created more elaborately decorated ones for the Nimowin. Fur trade Wool cloth was made available to the tribes, and this was soon substituted for deerskin in making garments. It also became a status symbol of wealth since, you know, anybody could have buckskin, but only those who could trade were able to get this cloth. Now, as you see, red and blue cloth were the first colors to come to the people. And they also included, you know, these trade goods, glass beads, ribbons, buttons, silk thread, Thimbles and needles were also made available to the women, and they used these precious new goods to create much more elaborate strap dresses. Now this strap dress is a copy of an older design uh, found in a museum and features original styles of decoration. Uh, you'll see the, uh, the beadwork, the copper or silver uh, conchos in the middle there, uh, ribbons, that were uh, you know, taken and used from the trades. It was a beautiful, uh, beautiful dress. Today, our nations are looking to their own history to create dance outfits traditional to their cultures. Joanne Soldier of Swan Lake has designed and created this beautiful outfit that features a wool strap dress, bandolier bag, and Ojibwe beadwork and moccasins, and she carries an, an old uh, bay blanket with her. In Ontario, the ladies on the right are recreating strap dresses and hoods worn by their own ancestors. Post-contact, woodland designs incorporated glass beads that were fashioned into these floral designs that feature local flowers, plants, berries, leaves, and the stems. Dance outfit for men and women were elaborate and colorful, and they included the distinct pucker toe moccasin. You can see it on the lady at the, on the right, and uh, bandolier bags for both men and women. By this time, uh, other nation styles began to show up uh, in the head roaches, the headbands, eagle feathers, and fans were now being added to the outfits of the Anishinaabe people. Around 1871, I'm sorry, around 1781, a smallpox epidemic wiped out thousands of Ojibwe in the Great Lakes region. Along with over trapping in the area, 
which led to fewer furs to trade, Bugwis and his family moved west. It was during this time that, uh, you know, many of our people were taking long canoe trips in search of fur-bearing animals for new trade routes and looking for trade partners. They traveled to many areas along the waterways, and recorded histories suggest that Bugwis may have seen that area uh, where the Red River and Assiniboine areas meet, Assiniboine rivers meet in one of those journeys before he actually decided to move there. Uh, Donna Sutherland has written this amazing book called Pegwis, A Noble Friend, and she includes extensive research on this portion of our history. They came across in the, in the canoes. By 1792, Bugwis was recognized as a chief among his people, and he probably was only about 18 years old uh, by the time he arrived along the Red River near Netley Creek with this band of about 200 Ojibwe's. They became known as the Soto of the Prairies by the French Courier de Bois uh, traders who they had met along, along the way. Bugwis and his band, they led a nomadic lifestyle during their first years along the Red River. They moved from place to place, camping when and where the best hunting and fishing opportunities were available. An abandoned Plains Creek camp at Netley Creek at the, at the mouth of the Assiniboine and Red Rivers eventually became the location of their main village. By 1795, Bugwis uh, was about 21 years old. And for genealogical purposes, we might suppose he had a wife or perhaps more than one wife by that time. And, you know, as history shows, he did have several wives over his lifetime. One of his first children was Wasasquato, his eldest son. Anishinaabe children did not have surnames, and the surname of Prince, which is a Pegwis name, was not assigned to his children until many years later, when only those who were baptized were given names. It is really difficult uh, to find a complete family tree for these early days, as written records were not part of our culture, and any recorded mnemonic devices are now lost to the ages. Nimuin was still being held in the spring and fall seasons. The new dances from the Sioux were readily incorporated into the celebrations. Nimuin were also held to celebrate victories in battle. It is documented on page 7 in the book Chief Pegwis and his descendants, written by Misku Neopan. Came back from the 1816 Battle of Seven Oaks, and that a two-day powwow was held to, quote, honor the bravery and the good work that they had done to protect the tribe. It was here in the new settlement where Bugwis and his people formed a good relationship with the Plains Cree, who brought new styles of dance, new regalia, and, and again, more styles of singing. Fur trading, especially the exchange of beaver pelts for goods, including firearms, flourished until the 1800s. Bugwis traded with representatives of fur companies, or indirectly through the Courier de Bois, and with Métis buffalo hunters. In 1812, Bugwis, oh, probably around 38 years old, he most likely had several children by this time, particularly considering the fact that he had several wives. It is recorded that... Uh, Kichiwis, or Big Apron, was one of his unbaptized sons. Now, until this time, the only white people the band knew well were the fur traders. By 1815, a group of white settlers from Scotland and Ireland arrived in the area. Known for his good nature and an instinct for trade, Bugwis was good to them. He, he fed them, protected them, and he helped them build homes. He had a unique connection with the settlers' leader, Lord Selkirk, with whom Bug was signed a peace treaty along with five other indigenous leaders. The most endearing connection with the settlers was the melding of the Scottish fiddle and the Irish folk dance. 
with the festive atmosphere of the Métis, the famous Red River Jig, or as it is known in Michif, Oyache Manin, is a combination of Indian footwork with Scottish, Irish, and French-Canadian dance forms. The accompanying fiddle tune is considered the official Métis anthem. Bugwis loved a good party, and he was also known to kick up his heels in a few rounds of dancing, too. In keeping with the customs of his original tribe, Bugwis always held a big celebration on the third week in June. Now, neighboring bands of Plains Cree, Plains Ojibwe, local Métis, and friendly white settlers would come. They would dance, feast, uh, watch the giveaway dances, and there would be arranged marriages, and they would celebrate the coming summer. Bugwis, uh, he is now known as Chief Pegwis, died on September 25, 1864. After Pegwis died, his son, Henry Prince, whose traditional name was Misko Ginu, Red Eagle, became chief of the Soto of the St. Peter's Reserve. On August 3rd, 1871, Chief Henry Prince and his counselors were the first signatories of Treaty 1, an era of hardship and betrayal by the governor, government of Canada became their fate. These are the actual words of the Indian Act. By 1880, alarmed by the generosity of the potlatch on the West Coast, the Government of Canada, through the Indian Act, prohibited BC Nation's cultural gatherings. And by eight, 1914, they amended the Indian Act to include the Prairie Provinces and the Territories. I'll just give you time to read that. For the proud indigenous nations, a piece of paper and foreign laws just would not stop their cultural practices. They just went deeper into the bush and far away from settle settlements to sing and dance in their own traditional ways and to pray in their own languages. Down the river road on the north side of the Red River, past Nutley Creek, there's a little clearing in the bush where the traditional people of St. Peter's held their celebrations. And we still use that on special occasions. In 1907, the lives of the St. Peter's Band was altered forever with the illegal surrender of the St. Peter's Reserve. By 1916, most of the families had moved to present-day Peguis, which is located 120 miles north of Winnipeg. So for many decades, the people of Peguis built a community out of the swamplands that they were get sent to. They drained the land, cleared the fields of rocks and boulders, and created their farms, began to build homes and barns. Although illegal, traditional people of Pegwa still held set lodge ceremonies on a little island in the middle of their new reserve, which is called Matutu Lake, Sweat Lodge Lake. Today, the home, uh, the area is home to Midemi Guan and his family. They've built a beautiful home and surrounded it with sacred lodges where they welcome many people to learn and participate in the traditional ceremonies of the Anishinaabe. <laughs> On May 17th, 1951, the Government of Canada, through Parliament, passed a bill to revise the Indian Act to give Indian bands more autonomy over their lives and to delete sections deemed inappropriate, those that included those restrictions on dancing, gathering in groups of more than 10, and other cultural activities. Celebrations were widely held all across Canada.
The drum and dancing connects us to all of those ancestors who have danced on the path of life. It is their tracks that they left which connects us, the Anishinaabe people, to the spirit world and to the relatives who dwell there. We are one with Mother Earth, honoring the four directions. We dance for our clan and for our people to honor the spirit of our nations. There are many stories that lay claim to the origin of the jingle dress dance. One tells of a father whose young daughter was dying and he was sent to dream of healing through a healing dance. There is still another story told by the people at Emo, Ontario, which begins in 1920, when Maggie Wilson, an Anishinaabe Cree girl, received a series of nine dreams which came together into the vision of the jingle dress. Little Maggie sought out other girls and they each made a dress in the four sacred colors, red, yellow, white, and blue, with four rows of jingles made from deer hooves and migas shells. Now she and these three little girls became the heart of the Jingle Dress Dance Society. Once exclusive to the Anishinaabe to be performed in ceremony, the Jingle Dress Dance has now made its way into the powwow circle and is danced by many nations across Turtle Island. There are particular songs which carry the beat, rhythm, and words of the jingle dress dance. They are held sacred by Ojibwe drum groups and singers. At one time, only Anishinaabe drums were called upon to sing for the, Anish for the jingle dress dance. During the next decade, as Anishinaabe families traveled to powwows, the dance spread to the Sioux of North Dakota. By 1950, it had spread westward into Montana. And by 1960, this dance style was rarely seen. <laughs> Women started wearing jingle dresses again in the 1970s, and currently the dance is wildly popular. As times change, so has the design of the jingle dress, and as tin, sheet metal, and Copenhagen tobacco lids became available, the lids were formed into cones and pierced. Cowrie, uh, mega shells, and deer hooves have been and, and are still used as regalia decorations since pre-contact. Metal cones are much more solid, but still represent the sound of the water. The cones are sewn onto the fabric in various patterns or placements as asymmetrically, symmetrically across the dress. One aspect of the jingle dress dance tradition that makes it so important in Indian country is that the dance coincided with the suppression of spiritual practices in Canada in 1914 and in the United States in 1921 when that outlawing of dancing became law. Anishinaabe women disregarded this new ruling as historic photographs show jingle dresses in 1920 and in every dec decade after. As the dance spread throughout the Anishinaabe nations, the jingle dress and its rituals were closely associated with how dynamic the women were in keeping up the health and spirits of their communities during the harsh conditions in the Great Lakes area. In 1971, Chief Edward Albert Thompson, a pipe carrier and a great-grandson of Bugwis, invited chiefs from the Long Plain and Birdtail Reserves to Pegwis Treaty Days. They brought with them a group of dancers and a drum group. The invited dancers and singers performed for several hours, followed by feasting and visiting. Now, this kind of dance and songs had not been seen or heard by Pegwis members in the community, you know, since 1916 when the people moved there. For many, that ancient heartbeat of the drum and jingling of the dancer bells awoke memories and a longing to bring this back to the people. In 1971, uh, Walter Cochran formed the Pegwis Powwow and Cultural Group. At the time, he was married to a woman named Dorothy, who was from Six Nations, and together they made buckskin outfits for the girls and boys and young adults, and they had recruited um, many families with an interest in reviving the powwow dance, bringing back the Nimuin to Pegwis. In 1981, Louis John Stevenson was elected chief of Pegwis First Nation. 
He had once worked for Indian and Northern Affairs, and he knew that our nation could not continue on a path to self-governance under their antiquated and high-handed form of governmental authority. He was a firm believer in the treaties and designed a flag that would honor and respect the first signatories of the first, na of the first treaty in Canada. The Pegasus flag shows the true intent of the treaties that were to endear as long as the sun shines, the grass grows, and the waters flow. He later added a red circle to show that the circle of life and our nation will go on forever. Chief Stevenson believed in our ways. He believed in our culture and he insisted that the powwow become a regular event in our community. The month following his election, he recruited young people who had an interest to hold a spring powwow at the school gym. Elder Myrtle Thomas was instrumental in helping young people as she recalled and shared protocols of the powwow. That same year, a traditional powwow was held during treaty days. This return of the powwow did not come easy to all members of Peguis. The residual effects of residential school would come out in several heated opposition confrontations. However, the chief and the newly formed Powell committee stood their ground and continued to learn protocols and how to organize a powwow. In a move to assert claim to our original territory at Selkirk, Chief Stevenson held a competition powwow at Selkirk Park. Under the guidance of Dennis Francis, an Ojibwe champion traditional dancer, it was a huge success as hundreds of dancers and drum groups came to participate. In 1983, Chief Peguis had just won another election, and he met with the powwow committee to discuss bringing an annual contest powwow to Peguis. Committee members were excited, and we quickly got to work. First, we had an arbor built. It was a traditional leafy arbor, and we built it at the south end of the treaty grounds. And then we got to work on getting the word out. Dennis Francis, stayed on for another year to bring uh, guidance to the committee. His influence and stature on the Powell Trail brings in champions from all across North America. Uh, Gordon Tatusis, uh, you may remember from uh, the television series North of 60, he's from Poundmaker and for the next several years he often came to dance at Pegasus Powell. Following protocol, Committee members asked for guidance from respected traditional knowledge keepers. Kay Herman Atkinson from Ro Rolling Rosso River, and Paul Huntinghawk from Rolling River were already their teachers in the Sundance. They were kind and gentle, and they shared many stories and teachings about the dances, the songs, the drum, and the traditions of the powwow circle. Another regular visitor and teacher was champion dancer Robert Kakagizik Sr. from War Road, Minnesota. He was instrumental in helping the committee of mostly women <laughs> understand what the grass dance means and what the dancer is doing out there on the arena floor. His generosity always remains a precious place in my memory. Eva McKay, she's a Dakota of Sioux Valley. She always brought her large family to dance at Peguis. And she too was generous in her teachings and shared considerable knowledge about the ladies' northern buckskin dance and about the woman's role at a powwow. The Chiniki Lake Drum Group from Nakoda uh, Territory at Morley, Alberta. They were one of the hottest drum groups back here in the mid 80s and Pegwas Powwow had them as host drum for three straight years. They returned to uh, Peguis in 1993 for the 10th anniversary of Peguis Powell to act as host drum. Do you remember I just told you a little story about Maggie Wilson and the dream dance of the jingle dress? Well, she married into the White family at Whitefish Bay and she was the matriarch of world-class singing group Whitefish Bay. This is uh, Maggie now. She passed away many, many years ago, but she influenced many dancers on the powwow trail. She was often dressed in traditional style dresses and short ankle flap moccasins. She carried an eagle wing fan and she could outdance women half her age. <laughs> she followed the traditional old style ways of dance, following that invisible trail of her ancestors. And in her opening prayers, she kept many a young dancer in the line 
with a gentle reminder to treat the sacred dance with respect and to honor their dresses. Maggie White was a knowledge keeper, and along with her sons and daughter-in-law, daughters-in-law, she was happy to share stories and teachings about the jingle dress with committee members. Chief Stevenson was a progressive leader, and he was really proud to lead our nation. He knew he lacked knowledge about the powwow, and that was, uh, you know, it was quickly becoming a major part of treaty days. And as I mentioned before, it was causing upheaval with uh, religion, religious people. He did not want to be this to become a problem. So he sat with uh, Elder Paul Huntinghawk and others such as Eric Robinson. Uh, in addition to seeking knowledge, Chief Stevenson often sponsored uh, men's dance specials. And uh, he really enjoyed being part of the Powell in that way. Now, Pegasus Powell soon gained a reputation on the Powell circuit for introducing new and upcoming MCs alongside the seasoned veterans. Eric Robinson, uh, who we saw earlier, and uh, this young gentleman here, Curtis Assiniboine, he did, they did their first MC gigs at Pegasus Powell. And they both went on to have many, many more Powell announcing gigs. On the, on the right, uh, seasoned announcing veterans like, late, like the late Mike Hotain and the late Gordon Washteshte were often called to Pegwas to do announcing duties. Committee members, uh, you know, we changed oh, many times over the years, uh, but usually original members would stay on. We really enjoyed working with these professional men as they carried the powwow over the three days. After years of hearing in the Medewin lodges that women owned half of all our lodges, nervous committee members decided to put that information to practice. Another first that Pegasus Powell introduced to the Powell Trail in Canada was to bring in a woman arena director. The first one was Linda Standing champion traditional dancer from White Bear, Saskatchewan. The second time we had a female arena director it was Karen Pheasant from Wequemekong, Ontario. And the third was Carla Bison, also from White Bear. Now, this new trend was not easily accepted. At the first event, some of the men were not too happy to take orders from a strong, capable woman carrying a big stick. But with perseverance, Regular announcements that our women owned half of this lodge and had every right to that authority. A majority of visiting dancers accepted these new rules and honored these young women and the roles that they played. Visitors from near and far have come to Pegwas Powwow over the years, and then many return year after year to enjoy the powwow and the Treaty Days events. Champion grass dancer Jonathan Windyboy, who is now Senator Jonathan Windyboy in Montana, on the uh, left side, and on the right is Ray Merrick. They often added Pegwas to their powwow trail and spoke highly of the powwow and its committee members. We have hosted so many beautiful dancers over the years. It hasn't been popular from some for some time now, but Pegwas used to present the top champions in the adult categories with handmade trophies. Some years it was handmade art by Stuart Stranger and our other artists. We revived this, uh, this thing in 2015 and 2016 for the specials champions at the two traditional powwows held during treaty days. These dancers are Kevin Hewahe, Prairie Rose Little Sky, Delvin Stanley, Eva McKay, Bonnie Tomasa, and Roy Bison. And they posed for this picture in 1995. This was the year our new arbor was built and we invited many champion dancers and drum groups to celebrate with us. Haystack drum, from Rocky Boy, Montana, and led by Senator Jonathan Windy Boy, was invited to Pegwas many times. And you know, through our research, we found that during these those turbulent years in the late 1880s and early 1900s, many of the warriors at St. Peter's 
They weren't happy uh, being relegated to learning to farm and raise cattle. Many of them left to join the fight against the Northwest Mounted Police, and they ended up joining other bands. And one of these renegade uh, Cree bands fled to the United States and became the Rocky Boy Cree Indians. Okay, Brown Eagle, take it away. Showtime, folks. Chicken dance. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a very old dance. Let's get ready to rumble. Uh, the dance is too good. Oh, my God. The dance is too good. Oh, my God. The dance is too good. Brian Klein is a Peguis band member and he lives in Winnipeg. Brian drives a recycling truck by day and is a champion hoops, hoop dancer at night and on weekends. These are my two nieces, Ellie and Kagan. They are the daughters of my younger sister Rhonda and Lawrence McCorister. Ellie designed and beaded her gorgeous ladies' northern traditional outfit that features many, many horses that she knows and admires. Kagan dances old style Jenga dress and she stays true to the Maggie White style of dance which honors the intent of the jingle dress as a healing dance. Bill Cochran Jr., or as he is known on the Powell Trail, Nature Boy, has been dancing since the early 80s when he joined the Pegasus Powell Dance Group. Traditional dancer Gary Sinclair didn't start dancing until his early 50s. He said he, he waited so long for, and finally went for it when he just couldn't stand sitting in those chairs while all those wonderful songs filled the air. Gary, with his striking outfit, has placed or won in the senior men's division many, many times. With a 35-year history, Pegasus Powwow has been a place for our membership to enter the dance circle and to enjoy the spirit of the powwow. There have been several powwow groups over the years, over the decades, and our community enjoys the annual Treaty Days powwow as well as the now annual Family Enhancement powwow in January. In 2016, these three lovely young ladies were crowned princess. 
Diane Spence, Miss Teen Princess, Lakeisha Cameron, Miss Pegwis Jr., Princess, and Mason Bear, Little Miss Pegwis. The Princess Pageant is a competition for the younger membership. There are three opportunities for girls to enter the Princess Pageant, Little Miss, Junior Miss, and the Teen Princess. The crowns are beaded by band members. These, in particular, were beaded by Robin Parisian and Jennifer Cameron. The details in the crown follow the traditions of Ojibwe beadwork and has plants and leaves that are found in Peguis. In this photo, the tiger lily and the oak leaf are featured. The annual powwow is a time for community members, organizations, and the powwow committee to hold specials that honor family members or to acknowledge special events. In 2015 and 2016, the McPherson family at the top, they honored one of their family members, Ivan McPherson. He had built the arbor in 1995. They honored him with a song and a men's fancy dance midnight special. In 2016, Chief Cindy Spence held a hat and boot special for ladies. Now this contest combines dance with rodeo culture and creates a unique performance by the contestants. Then Chief Cindy Spence in 2015, we approached the family of Chief Louis Stevenson to request permission to hold a special senior and junior men in two dance categories to honor the memory of the longest running chief in our community. In this photo, the family is preparing for the honor song and they are in front of a table that's uh, filled with gifts, prizes, and trophies for the champions. Another honoring uh, is to honor the graduates. The Pegwis School Board hosts an annual event at the Pala where they recognize and honor the graduates in post-secondary. Each graduate receives a Pendleton blanket and a dance in the honor song. In addition to the cultural pride in dancing, another value of Pala dancing are health benefits. Vigorous actions and constant movement that a dancer employs while at a powwow you know, creates a healthy body. Many dancers are in the gym and on the running tracks or trails to keep fit and they eat a healthy diet in order to maintain a strong body. Passed down from generations. Although many of our nations were forced to put away this knowledge for safekeeping and danced in secret, that was in the past. Today, our young people are picking up the bundles that we now hold and are proudly representing their nations, their community, and their families in powwows that are held year-round across the great land that we know as Turtle Island. This is Little Miss Pegless Mason Bear, and she's been dancing since she was able to walk. Her mom, Shannon Bear, began dancing at 10 years old as a jingle dress dancer, too. This mother-daughter team have represented our community in the Powell Circles for some time now, and she was so proud of her role as Little Miss Pegwis. Kinanaskomitin, miigwech, thank you for coming on this journey of the Pegwis Powell dance history. Miigwech.